and welcome to this ESA Hangout. Did you manage to see much of the launch, Luca, or were you too busy with press? Well, I, I was busy until um, about two minutes from launch, and then they, they, let, they let me go, and I was able to actually watch the whole launch. Okay. It was uh, one year ago exactly that you were launched yourself. Does this, did watching Alexander Gas launch bring back any memories? Oh, yeah. Well, it doesn't take much to trigger the memories. It's such an uh, astounding moment in your life that um, I, I really, I recall every second of those nine minutes and 48 seconds of launch. So uh, I knew exactly what was going through uh, those guys' minds and what was happening and, and what they were doing and what pages they were they were flipping and, and what they were waiting for. So yeah, I was. It should certainly trigger a few good memories. We have until we have a good five, six hours to wait before we see more images of the Soyuz and the crew inside. Can you tell us what are they doing right now? Yes, yes. Um, so the biggest difference between the, the two-day rendezvous and the six-hour rendezvous is that. The six-hour rendezvous is very dynamic. Everything happens really fast right after orbit insertion. So right now, the, the left seater, the, the co-pilot and the commander are split into two different pages, and they're forming different parts of the checklist. They are still coordinating to each other so that they both know what's happening. But right now, the commander is responsible for the attitude of the, of the spacecraft, and he's checking that all the numbers correspond to what is expected. Because in a few minutes they will do the first corrective burn. That is the burn that makes the uh, orbit that right now is elliptic. It will make it circular. So right now um, they have an perigee of about 180 kilometers and an apogee of about 250 kilometers. And this first burn will make that that orbit 250 kilometers, about just about round. In the meantime, the copilot. He's checking that the spacecraft is performing correctly. He's making sure that there are no leaks. He's making sure that uh, all the systems are, are uh, in, um, working correctly. The computer is making sure that all the automatic, automatic systems that need to be deployed did, did their job. And also, he's making sure that the engines are in the correct configurations. And all these will come, will last, this parallel work will last for about half an hour, where they are busy working in different edges and integrating their knowledge and talking to the ground at the same time. Okay. In the, so that will keep them busy for the first half now. But yes. What do they do afterwards? After that, uh, they will add four more burns. And because of uh, orbital mechanics, you do the burns at specific points in the orbit where to perform a so-called Hohmann transfer. It is the easiest way to change orbit. So basically, they will wait a very specific moment. The computer is, is calculating continuously what is the exact moment to turn on the engine. And we have the timing. And so we check, we check the system. We check that the computer is, is performing according to what the knowledge that we have. And then basically, we are ready to intervene should something happen. And then happens, uh, they will do four burns and, uh, every 90 minutes, basically. And, they, and then they will raise the altitude um, to, to the orbit of the space station. Because of orbital mechanics right now, they're, they're flying faster than the, than the space station. So they're catching up to it. And then in the, in the next couple of burns, they will slow down and raise the altitude. And that's when they will be about four hours, in about five hours, five and a half hours, they will be at the same altitude of the space station ready to dock. So, you have um, a couple of peaks of uh, intense activities, which is when the engines turn on, when the spacecraft comes alive and starts forming, uh, moving to get the right orientation, followed by uh, a quiet time where they, they're just enjoying the view, uh, relaxing, they're thinking about what happens if, if we have an emergency right now, um, what steps do we do, do we transform into uh, a two, a two days around the moon, we have to go back to ground. They're taking all that into consideration. A lot to think about. Uh, we have a question from 
Salvatore via the hashtag ESA Hangout. Don't hesitate to ask your own questions via Twitter using the hashtag. Uh, Salvatore wants to know when you were finally sitting inside the Soyuz on launch day, Luca, what, what did you feel? Well, I have to say that I, I felt, felt that day uncomfortable because the Soyuz is extremely small and the seat is really cramped. Uh, so if you are uh, taller than one meter, 1.8 meters uh, or six feet, um, you are going to be in pain because you sit down for about two hours before launch and then you are, you are sitting uh, completely strapped for another hour after launch. So for about three hours you have your knees basically next to your nose, which is, it is not my way of relaxing and unless you are a yoga master, uh, you, you, know, you probably have a having I mean, some trouble relaxing. But we are excited, you know, you're in a spacesuit, you're just about ready to launch. So um, the way I describe it is when I go back and think about what was happening, it's a, it's almost as if there were two two Luca at the same time. One Luca was the astronaut and I was you know I was focused on the launch, on the procedures, on the instrument. I just I was thinking I, I hope I don't screw this up. You know, I was I was really I was so focused on, on doing all the right the right motion at the right time the right communication. And on the other side, there was Luca, the man, and I was more almost observing as a third person. I was I was trying to record everything in my mind, everything that was happening, the acceleration, the rumble from the engines, the the thinning of being scorched into the seat, and then. The, mo the momentary um, break when the, the, the boosters fall out and then the acceleration again on the second peak uh, with the second stage uh, turning on and then the quietness 8 minutes and 48 seconds later and of course the first orbital sunrise that I watched through the window that was, that was just something that unfortunately I have no, no words to describe and all that is one, one continuous memory from, from beginning to end. Okay, I'd like to go on to a caller called Mirko, Mirko Gumparetti. Sorry, you can say it better than me. Yeah, Mirko Gumparetti. From uh, Milan in Italy. Buonasera. Hello, everybody. So, uh, it's, uh, you started your gate experience just one year ago, and uh, now that you are back, uh, back, on, back on Earth, on Mother Earth, how did uh, this experience change you as, uh, as a human being here on Earth? And, uh, for instance, considering your point of view on, uh, on life problems that we have here on, uh, on Earth, after viewing them from, uh, from the top, let's say. Also about ecology and recycling waste. That's a very good question. Um, first of all, let me, let, me, uh, let me introduce it with, uh, with a, by making something a, a, small, um, a small comment that I think any experience is, needs to change us one way or another. Uh, that's, it, it is the, the meaning of evolution in a way, but also becoming more mature, understanding more about what surrounds you. And you, don't, you certainly don't have to go to the space station to, uh, to have that uh, with you. So any experience should make us a better person. Um, it's hard to say in what way I have changed because, because to me, I am myself. So maybe other people can see me and, and, and see more of the change. But um, one thing that I noticed is in me is that um, I have more of, a, of an appreciation for perfection. And what I mean by that is that um, if, if, you know, if you know Sting, the singer, there is a song where he says, to search for perfection is to live here in hell. And I disagree. I, I noticed that we are surrounded by perfection. We just forgot how to notice it. So I like, I like to look at the sky on any given day, uh, whether it's sunny or cloudy or rainy, and to remind myself that the sky is just about perfect, even though it's always changing. The same with the sea. You know, I, I come from Sicily. For me, the, the, my, uh, uh, my attraction towards the sea is, is, is constant. I, I don't feel very well if I'm far away from the sea for too long. And every time I see it, whether it's a winter storm or a, or a, or a summer night, I just feel more at peace and I remind myself that it's, that it's perfect. And so 
so is the world and people that surround me. Uh, we, we are surrounded by perfection and I, what I notice is that now I appreciate it more and uh, I am surprised and wondered and feel wonder about this. And maybe maybe what I, what I wish is that more people were able to feel that wonder. Um, we, have, we have access to so much information nowadays. You have a smartphone, you have access to uh, all that humankind has ever found. And so we, we, forget, we forget how to, to feel the wonder. And that's why I like to talk to kids so much, because they, they're still capable of feeling the wonder. This, that is one way in which I've changed. As to, as to ecology or living problems, well, again, I, I, shouldn't, I, I don't want to think that you need to be an astronaut in order to, to feel the need for change. Uh, certainly, uh, we only have one planet, and we realize how fragile it is. And even if it means um, carrying my groceries every day in my hands and not, not getting an extra plastic bag, well, maybe if everybody does that, you know, six billion people, at six billion less plastic bags in the world, we can change. We can change the world and save it one plastic bag at a time. I will stop there. Thank you. That leads into a, another question from Twitter that was asked before we started. Uh, at Windy City, would like to know, as you're a role model for children, how do you uh, work to inspire? children in science and engineering and careers? Well, first of all, I have to, I have to really make sure that, that I'm a good role model. So that, that, is still to be, that is still debatable, of course. Um, but um, in general, it's, uh, I do, it's exactly what I'm doing right now. Um, I, don't, I don't need to come up with anything. Um, it's, uh, to me, for me, it's very simple. I, I just tell a story. And I don't have to invent anything. I tell a story of a dream. Uh, I've, I've had this dream since I was a very little kid. And um, technology, science, studying these subjects has helped me realize that dream. So you don't have to become an astronaut to realize your dreams. You can have bigger dreams or completely different dreams. And whatever broad helps you realize it, then you should follow it. I just believe that. Um, a, a career in, in science, a career in technology, a career in engineering is, is a way to really connect with the future. So when I tell my story, that's what I tell. And uh, if even one out of ten kids that listens to my story is inspired by that, then I think I'm doing my job. Sure you are. Well, I much, I much uh, enjoyed reading your stories from space so, and editing them. <laughs> <laughs> And um, I'm not even a kid. So. I'm not even a kid, so I'm sure it works even better for them. Uh, moving on, uh, an interesting question from Matt on G Plus on Google Plus. Um, did you ever suffer from space sickness? Um, which one? Because uh, there's uh, there is space sickness in, uh, in that, there's motion sickness, you know, in getting space. And you, and you, and you don't feel good, and uh, I haven't. I, I never suffered from that. I, I felt great uh, as soon as I got to space. It was such an exhilarating feeling. Uh, I was elated at being in space and flying, floating. It was amazing. But then there is also this space sickness in tenderness. You come back down and you want to go back up right away. And uh, I have to admit that I've been a little bit. Uh, homesick in that sense, and I, I do wish to that I could go back. And even though I'm not, I'm, I'm not in general a very endless person. In my life, I'm lucky enough that I never had to envy anything. Uh, I am very happy right now for Alex and me and Max because I know what they, I know what expects them, and it's it's beyond any any imaginable dream. It's better than anything they can imagine. Especially for Alex and me, Max has already been on the space station once, but Alex and we are in for a, for a fantastic time, and so I, I you know, I, I'm, I'm, I'm really, I'm not envious because I, because I, I had my, my chance, and I think I'm, 
I don't have another chance soon, but I'm just so happy for them, so excited. It's, it's, um, I'm looking forward to seeing them entering the space station and starting the, the trip there. Yeah, it's a mythic uh, duo, and they're going to do such a great job, and I'm looking forward to seeing them working together on this session. Are you, they will be arriving at the station uh, in a few hours. Are you going to wait to stay up for that to set the alarm clock? Hell no. <laughs> you watch the replay. Oh, yeah. <laughs> okay, I'd like to uh, ask the, another joiner, Joanne Clement, to ask her question. She's from the UK. Okay, I'm really sorry. This is a very boring question compared with the dreams that we've just been talking about. Um, most people find their digestive systems affected by even a, a flight if they go away on holiday. So do astronauts need to observe a specific diet pre-launch to help the digestive system adjust to microgravity? And how long does it take before you feel that your, your system, your body, is working as it should once you're on orbit? Well, first of all, let me, let me say that there are no boring questions. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Sometimes we give very boring answers, however. So That's okay. <laughs> the joke is more it's on me. Uh, how long does it take to adjust or to, uh, to get used to, to space? Everybody's different. Everybody's different. But in general, I would say that apart from the initial um, shock, if you want to say that, the feeling space, you know, or uh, feeling your nose hurt because, because of the fluid shift. Um, having to having the need to go to the toilet every few hours because you need to get rid of the extra fluid that your body feels, a little bit of a backache. I would say that after two weeks, you have the, you have the sensation that you're really getting you're, you're getting to know your way around and how to get around using your body you, because you need to get adjusted. You need to be used to using your body in space. So after two weeks, that's that's when you feel really comfortable. And after one month, you forget you ever had a, a, a body weight. And I would say that that's the, that's the, the longest, you know, and three or four weeks, and you're, you're ready to, to do anything. You, you feel like that's been your home. And um, weight, what was that? It's, it's just it's, uh, it's as fast as that. But the crazy <laughs> thing is that after two months, you look at the watch, and you're like, it's really been two months. And before you know it, you're coming back, and, and here I am a year later. And so, thank you. So, but when you come back to Earth, does it take a time for your body, like the eating and the, the digestive process, to adjust back to normal? Oh, you know, you know, for a person like me, I can eat rocks. If you give me, <laughs> if you give me the proper sauce, you know, barbecue sauce, <laughs> I, have, okay. I don't have any problem eating a nice salt <laughs> rock. But, but in, in general, um, in general, there is no adjustment in digesting or and I can suggest an experiment. If you want to do this at home, you can you can turn yourself upside down and try to drink some water, and you find out that you can do it. You can you can you can drink in any any direction, even on even on the ground. Your your organs work differently, so you can drink or eat in any any direction. Maybe you don't want to try it, but you can. Um, but, uh, so it doesn't take any time to get adjusted to to, to those kind of activities. Now. Um, of course, there are some physiological acts that need adjusting because the way we do it on orbit requires some precautions. But other than that, uh, it's really it's really not a big deal. And coming back, or oh, it, okay. within within hours, you are back to normal. Okay. Thank you very much. That's wonderful. You're welcome. Okay, look, we have a follower, a J E Benuda who has been watching the live stream from the ISS. And he or she seems to have noticed that the, the ISS has moved and wonders if that's to do with the docking of the new Soyuz survivor with Alexander, Reed, and Maxime. That's a very good observation. That is absolutely correct. The, um, the space station right now is in a different orientation because the docking maneuver requires the space station to be um, with, a, with the axis, with the Russian segment basically facing the, the, in, in the direction of the flight, but normally it's the other way around. 
And is it 180 degrees as as it seems to be on the, yes, the live stream? Yes, that is correct. And then they will, if, I, if, if they're docking in the same port where I docked uh, a year ago, there will also be a pitching maneuver so that um, so that the, the, the spacecraft is in, uh, uh, in, in the port is in the direction of the flight, and and the docking can can uh, can work normally. But why doesn't it stay in that direction always? Why does it move and back the other way? That's just the way the control systems work. We have um, we have some uh, we have systems that they, they correct the CG of the space station, and just the way we adjust the altitude, um, that is the, the normal way for us to, to travel. Okay. Great. Um, Let's move on to another question. Um, Luca, what was your very best moment in space? Yeah, from Anka Kropkaiser. Do you need glasses? I do, yes. Obviously, I'm not an astronaut. <laughs> so it's, it's hard to. I was in orbit for 167 days. So that's a lot of moments. And it's, it's hard to pick the very best moments. There are a lot of more memorable moments I, that I can remember, of course. Launch, get into the station, when ATB arrived, when we had the Italian dinner that I prepared with all, with all the friends. And, but of course, you know, it, um, for, for me, as a dream, something that I never never thought would really happen, and it was always a dream since, since the time when I was a kid, maybe, maybe I would say the EVA. It was, uh, it was such an amazing experience and uh, such a privilege to be able to do that. Uh, not, not, every, not every astronauts get to do ABA, and I, I, got, I got to do ABA on my very first mission. I hope to do more EVAs in the future. I even survived um, um, an EVA accident, which was a very good day for, for space flight. So all in all, the, maybe if I were to pick one moment that highlighted my mission, it could be that one. But uh, I, would be, I would be lying, because in reality, I, I, can, I can talk of thousands, if not millions, of moments that I can recall um, with, you know, with absolute beauty and joy and uh, and happiness of being there. Okay. But when you say that the EVA was maybe one of the best moments, were you referring to the first one or the second one? Both. Both. You know, the second one was great because I'm here telling you about it. You survived. Oh, yeah. <laughs> so. Okay. Um, let's go back to Joanne. I think she has another question for us. I've actually been very greedy. Um, I've got two questions, so I'll actually ask the first one first. Um, do astronauts on the ISS leave mementos or little things behind for their successors to find? Nothing to do with work, but personal stuff. So, I mean, the shenanigans, for example, the group of 2009, are you leaving things for each other to find? Well, um, every you know, it's it's something that every astronaut decides for them, for themselves. Um, I did not did not leave anything in my room for my friends and colleagues because I knew they were all going up. With, um, um, it wasn't going to take a lot of time, and we really didn't have any time to come up with a plan like that. And um, maybe Alex will do something like that. Um, um, maybe maybe a secret. I know that the Chumps, which is the class that was selected the same year as my class, I know that they have a very little bit of a plan. They, uh, Mike Hopkins, I think, brought up a little book uh, where everybody can sign their names, and then when every every chump that goes up can sign his name and own it and uh, and come up with a uh, with a little bit of a tradition. I, I I didn't have enough time or enough fantasy to think about something to do. Uh, if I had my if I had my, my choice, I would have left a booby trap. But there was too much time in between. So <laughs> there was too much time in between. So I, I didn't want somebody else to, to fall into one of my booby traps and then I would get in trouble. So uh. brilliant. Thank you very much. You're very welcome. Okay, we have another question um, on Google Plus from Connie Kramer. Connie Kramer. Um, 
she wants to know uh, what do you think Alex will enjoy most during this time in space? Well, I don't know. Maybe it's German food. <laughs> I don't know. You you would have to know Alex. He is going again. It's um, an experience like this. He's going to stay another 167 days in orbit. There's just so much to enjoy. But uh, again, he also he will probably go out on an EVA. I I really hope that he gets to do an EVA. And if he does, it's going to be a fantastic experience for him. Um, it, you know, he's a he's a geophysicist. So who knows? Maybe every time he gets to, he gets to watch the Earth from from up there, he's, he's going to see some some of the fantastic places he already is being. He spent time from Antarctica to New Zealand to Europe to the States. So he, he's really he's in a world traveler. He, he probably loves the Earth at least as much as I do, and so. Who knows, maybe that's the thing that he's going to enjoy the most. It's such a personal thing. Uh, I don't know how to answer that because I don't even know how to answer that question for myself. Well, let's hope he answers it himself from space Certainly. shortly. Uh, let's go back to Mirko, who has another question for us. Yeah, I was wondering uh, to know how do how frequently do you connect with your relatives and uh, friends here on the ground when you are on the space station? Because you have a tight schedule on uh, a tight work schedule on uh, on the station, so how do you match those two activities? Let's say. Well, first, first, uh, first, you have to understand that uh, you know we are aware of that. So you know you're leaving for six months, and um, there are people that that live on 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 big on ships or are deployed for even longer times without all the commodities that we do have. However, on the space station, we have technology on our side, and especially lately, technology has really helped us a lot. We have access to the internet. Um, we have the capability to make phone calls and to, to write emails and receive emails. So um, most of us will will take a little bit of a little bit of time in the evening after the evening DPC, the daily planning conference that ends the working day. And before going to bed, that's our free time. So for me, uh, my routine was to call my wife and my parents. I had to call my mom because I'm Italian. So uh, that was that was my routine every 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 evening. And then that's also when I would uh, check my pictures of the day. I would um, make sure that they, that I would pick the ones that I wanted to tweet the next day or maybe maybe the same day, um, and then send them out. Post them on Facebook, on Twitter, and uh, on other social media. Maybe write my blog and call people, call my friends, or write emails, just like you would do if you were very busy on a, on a, on a very busy day. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Luca, that reminds me of a question I've been wanting to ask for myself for a long time. Uh, on the space station, there must be there's it's such a unique experience. I can imagine that you would want to delay going to bed as long as possible. I just wondered how how much sleep uh, did you get in reality? And it's true. It's true that um, some astronauts get to don't get, go to sleep really late. I, I'm more of a, of a morning person than than a, a late night person. I, I'm extremely boring at parties for that reason. Uh, but um, uh, in orbit, the truth is that because you are Basically, your body is fully relaxed for about 22 hours a day, and the only time when you're really doing physical effort is when you're exercising on the on the exercise machine, so a red or the the treadmill. So you don't need as much rest. I, I slept about six hours a night, so I would go to, to sleep around midnight, and I would wake up at 5:50 or 6 o'clock, and usually I would wake up by myself without the alarm. So. Um, so my, my I really had eight, 18 hours every day to do to do all the things I wanted to do, and not too bad. that's not too bad. And I know I know of astronauts that actually would sleep even less than that, and they would take advantage of the of the, the night when everything is quiet and you have all the space that you wanted. You could fly into cupola without bothering anybody and take shots of places that you don't usually see because if you fly over Australia during the night, then it means that during the day you never get to see it. So actually, I did that. I I really wanted to take a picture of Air's Rock, so I, I set an alarm. So I stayed up really late one day, 
and I went into Google and I looked for Ayers Rock until I could take a picture and uh, and I found it and I, I felt like a hero and uh, and it worked really well for me. But it was Saturday night, so the next day I didn't have to work. <laughs> I remember that picture. It was nice. Uh, this is an interesting question. Uh, it's a bit of travel advice, maybe. Uh, Matthias Carter would like to know, after being in space and having seen the Earth from above, what is the place you would now most like to visit? Yes, that's a very good question. I have asked myself that question too, and um, it's really hard to pick a place. You know, it's when, when you get to see about 90% of the of the. <laughs> Uh, land, it's like you, you, you've seen everything in space and everything looks so beautiful. From the highest peaks of, uh, of Chile and South America to the deserts of Africa and Asia, they all look so beautiful and enticing. And to me, those are all uncharted territories. And so they're all, they all look intriguing. And when I saw the waters of the Great Barrier Reef, that's where I wanted to go. When I saw New Caledonia, and I learned that it's one of the it's like paradise on earth. I wanted to go there, but then I saw some of the the, um, the deserts with all the sand dunes in Africa, and I was like, wow, this must be so spectacular seen from down there. And then I saw the glaciers in South America, and that's where I wanted to go. So I really, I just, I don't know. But there's one place, there's one continent that I've never seen with my own eyes, and that's uh, Australia and Oceania. So. Maybe if I if I were to if I if I had the money which I don't and I, and I and I could pick one destination I would probably I would probably start right there from Australia I have some friends and it's a place I've never been and I'll, I always tell myself that, that the next place I want to live in is the one I haven't been yet so that's where I will start. Great answer. Um, I think we have one time for another question from uh, Joanne. Hang on, sorry, sorry, I hadn't unmuted. Um, you meant you touched on finding a, a, the right moment to use the cupola for your taking your pictures. Was there ever a moment when there were sort of two or three of you fighting over space in the cupola because there was something particular that you all wanted to get at at the same time? So we don't use the fighting ever on the space. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, we. Uh, uh, there were certainly times where, uh, if something was happening, we, we all wanted to, to be in there. And the easiest thing to do is that you all go in there and you share the space. And um, um, you know, we have different cameras that we can use different lenses, take different pictures. And actually, we would try to be cooperative. So if Chris was taking a big picture using the, the long 400 lens. And then uh, Karen loved to use uh, the 50, and I would maybe be taking a picture with, with a, a 10 millimeters or a, or maybe the 180, and, and have different different kind of pictures of the same event. Um, but we, the, the good thing about going to space in, uh, for 167 days or six months is that you're probably going to see the same same place a few times. So really, there's there's no need for uh, for passing uh, over an event. As a matter of fact, there was one day where I got I got an email from the realm saying, hey, um, down in Sicily, the, uh, Mount Etna, which is the volcano right next to my city, erupted. And so what did I do? I called the others and said, hey, let's come and take pictures of Mount Etna erupting. And so they all came and we all took pictures and then we shared them. And it's, uh, you know, it, it's better the way. When you can, when you can share an experience, it it actually feels a lot better because you can you can talk about it and you, you, have, you it's it's almost as if the experience is extended. Uh, it's there is more of it. So no, we never fought over space or or cupola or or an image. Thank you very much. I remember your picture from Etna, um, and it, it it included everybody on Twitter and everybody who's ever looked at your blog. So the inclusiveness that you shared with us is greater than even perhaps you realize. So thank you very much. Well, thank you for reading my blog. My, my thank you. <laughs> OK, Luke, you said you're, you're not an evening person. It's getting late. What I would like to I'm about to collapse. As exactly. about to collapse. <laughs> I'd like to ask you one more question. Uh, when the new arrivals 
uh, talk with the space station. Mm -hmm. So Alex, uh, Max, and Reed, uh, could you just describe the steps that they will go through? What, the, what's in the planning? Yes. So um, in about five hours now, I believe they will be they will be ready to dock. And the docking is is, is a fantastic experience. The machine, uh, the, the soils works mostly automatic, automatically, and um, the commander and the, the co-pilot basically make sure that everything is going according to plan. So it's very intense. And I, one thing I told me is to make sure that even though he's supposed to check all the instruments, to at least steal a glance outside the window on his left side because it's a sight that he doesn't want to miss. I missed it, so I need to go back so that I can check it out. And um, um, and then after the dock, which is the docking is a definite bump, you know, you feel you feel that docking you're like, hey, we're there, you know, and you look at you look around and like, are we really there? Yes, we are, and it's you know, it's fantastic. And but then this whole procedure of um, of equalization and making sure that docking is correct and and then there are no leaks starts, and it takes a while. It takes about an hour and a half before before you're ready to open the hatch. After you do all these procedures. Um, everybody flies back in the in the bay hall, which is the top part of the Soyuz. Um, you take off your um, your spacesuit if you still have it on, and put on a clean uh, flight suit. And then and then you knock on you knock on the side on your side with the hatch, and they knock on the other side of the hatch. And you know that everybody's ready, so you open the hatch, and then they open the hatch. With little, maybe with a little bit of pushing from your side, and then and then it's big hugs. For everybody, and even though you're exhausted, you are so energized by being on the space station. Um, you know, you, you haven't slept well in days because of the tension, because of the excitement. You hug your friends that you haven't seen in months. Um, I know Swanee is looking forward to seeing them. I talked to him yesterday on the on the loop, and so he's looking forward to meeting them. There will be big hugs, and they will have water and juice for them uh, to enjoy. Maybe cookies if they were if they're really nice they will have cookies ready for them and there's hugs all around and then and then they get ready for their first space to ground uh, video conference where they you know they they will fly in the SM they the whole crew six people and and they have a chance to talk to their beloved ones uh, down on the ground so uh, I read daughters and and wife uh, certainly um, uh, Alex's girlfriend and and his family, and, and it's 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 really nice because it's a way for them, for for you to tell to the ground, hey, this is amazing. It's 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 more than I expected, and yes, it's it's fantastic, and this was the best thing I've ever done. And it's it's a way for for the ground people to tell you we support your your choice, and we will miss you for the next six, six months. But we are so happy to see you happy. And, and that's all. That's that's really all it's about. And um, and I still remember the first call I ever said, and down to the ground. Which was? Which was ciao mamma. <laughs> <laughs> hey, I'm Italian. What can I say? <laughs> what can I say? <laughs> um, I think uh, we'll keep. We'll leave it at that. Um, we can. People at home can follow in. On the docking in about five hours, as you said. Just like I said. Just like Lucas says, he knows everything. Uh, live coverage starting on ESA TV. Um, Joanne, Mirko, do you want to say goodbye? Yes, yes, thank you very much indeed. You're very welcome. Thank you for thank you for uh, waiting waiting up for uh, for this conversation. I'm really happy that you came along. It was fantastic. Grazie tanto. Thank, thank you very much for uh, for this opportunity and for the opportunity to speak with you. I'm very proud. I, I followed all uh, all of your pictures on Flickr and all of all of your posts on all your Twitters, and I'm very proud of uh, the flag you are wearing on your left shoulder. Uh, yeah. So thank you very much. Yeah, 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 I'm very proud of it. Thank you. Thank, thank you for, uh, for your patience and uh, always remember that it's the other way around. When you ask me a question, you. You're giving me a gift. You're giving me a gift on your time and your curiosity, and you're giving me a chance to to tell my story. So it's me. Who actually, uh, thank you guys for your patience and for listening to me. Thank you very much. Okay, so we were live at the Columbus Control Center.
uh, in Oberpfaffenhofen in, in Germany. Uh, Luca, where are you going now? So tomorrow I'm going back to Cologne. Uh, and then I have just one day, and then I'm flying back to Rome, and then back to Cologne, and then back, and then to London for two days, and then back to Houston. So I still have a, um, some. Even though I'm not on the ISS, I'm still moving fast. Yeah, tell you that. <laughs> I can see. Jet set life. Thank you, Luca, and thanks everybody for watching. Thank you, and have a great night. And go Blue Dot, go Alex, go Max, go Reed. Absolutely. <laughs> Ciao. Thank <laughs> you.